Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct privilege to introduce to you the last speaker of our seminar. He's a man of many trades, a distinguished writer, a film critic, and a very articulate personality. He has written extensively on contemporary political and social issues in India and Manipur in particular, with specific interest in identity politics and conflict. With a round of applause, please welcome Dr. Angom Cha Bimol Akhoizam. Thank you, uh, first of all, uh, for inviting me to share some of my thoughts on what's going on in Manipur, Manipuri Diaspora Association Chandigarh. Uh, it's been a long time that I've been a frequent visitor to this university. They stopped inviting me, and probably that's why I don't come very frequently. I can see my friends here, Pompa Mukherjee, who is the chairperson of the political science department. My student, uh, Professor Vinod, he is the chair of sociology. He asked me to speak in his department today, so I had a session with them. After a long time, I could sense this. But uh, I am primarily here to share my concerns on what has befallen on my home state. I have been out of my home state for more than 40 years now, almost four decades, and I still call that home. And I don't intend to stay back in Delhi after I retire. I want to go home stay and spend the rest of my life in that beautiful place that we call home. And that has been uh, seriously traumatized in the last four months. And it affects me, uh, not only intellectually, politically also, but more so existentially. It, 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 it almost feels as if somebody has stabbed me multiple times on my body. And I try to understand even those people who commit that violence on me and trying to understand why these things have been happening. When I opened my mouth at the beginning of the violence in May, I was asking for peace and uh, the writ of the state to be imposed, to rein in the violence and ask for peace and try to understand the grievances of various sections of the society. I tried my best and still I still hold on to that idea. But one must make a distinction between a sense of helplessness and accepting insults or otherwise I choose myself to stand up for myself. And I call this being assertive without being aggressive. I am here as a mighty, a prominent community from that state of Manipur. And I am here as a citizen of that state beyond that identity as well. And I am here also as a human being for concern with these developments. If you have listened to some of my interviews at the beginning of this crisis itself, I've expressed it pains me to see young students and girls running away, hounded by people from Imphal. I was pained by the anxieties of my students from the tribal as well as Maitais. And when I say that and ask for peace, some people think that it is a sign of my weakness. Or anybody who is asking for peace and coexistence, some people seem to have taken it as a sign of weakness and timidity. The point is, it is not. It is one of the most courageous things to accept the pain being inflicted on you. At the same time, trying to understand the wrongs that I must have done. If you take it, the statement, there could be mistakes, 
wrongs that could have been done by the Maitis. That must also be reflected. But I was desperately waiting for a voice of sanity and a capacity to accept mistakes of each other rather than taking a self-righteous positions and go on blaming the other community as a demon and villainize that, that is purely unacceptable to me. And I must stand up and I have done that. You can see this position that I have taken. And by being assertive, you will still find me that I am my basic appeal is to my community to be what I think what they should be. Civilized, gentle, follow your forefathers, ethical ways of life, even when you fight. But Maitais have also made mistakes. They don't follow. The acts that they have committed, which they should not have, those mistakes must be realized. This is an appeal to my own community. But even when I say these things to my community, I can see on social media, such as Twitter and others, laughing at contemptuously and trying to counter. When I asked the Indian Army to ensure that his sanctity as an organization and integrity of his men must be protected and preserved, even then people laugh at it. without realizing that I have been saying that their institutions have collapsed. Manipur Police as an institution has collapsed. Bureaucracy has collapsed. But there are institutions which I expect to stand, not affected by these things, not being a part or a party to this conflict. And that's what I was appealing, that the Indian Army must ensure that its sanctity and integrity of its man must be protected. Because institutions like this are very crucial. When the rest of the institutional mechanism collapse, these institutions are important for us. That's the appeal. And people laugh at it. And they talk about, oh, Manipur Police, you should be talking about it. Those are nothing but bullshitting. When I was saying about the Indian Army must sustain itself with sanctity and institutions. I was emphasizing the fact that there are the institutions that can be collapsed, but there are certain institutions which are paramount for this country to stay as a lawful existence. That was the appeal. And I must say this here again. So we must ask crucial questions and be honest to oneself ready to accept one's own mistakes and stand up for yourself as well without losing your basic empathy and concerns for the other. When Amarjit told you, we know that we have not been talking. There are people whom you keep in touch at a personal level. Many of them can't speak out. But thankfully, among the Maitais, you will have diversity of voices. That's something that I'm very proud of. We're not a herd. If somebody says, do this, that all of you will meekly follow that. No, we will not. We have diversity of opinions. That's why the tension started appearing among ourselves as well. Now let's see, from this vantage point, as this crisis have dragged on for more than four months now, one fundamental starting point. There could be competitive or competitive narratives. Narratives competing with each other on the nature of the violence. But let's accept with the empirics first that this violence has been going on for four months. Is there a different opinion on this? Can we have a different opinion? Are you going to deny that this violence has not happened for four months now? Will you deny that? That's empirics. There is no two opinions. There are no competing narratives on that. Two, the Indian state, the one of the most powerful state in the world, has it been able to stop the violence 
yes or no louder is it a fact or fiction this is a fact that the indian state has failed to stop the violence these two facts must be kept in front of us and then ask the remaining questions why what wherefore of these two facts why this violence has continued for so long what is this nature of this violence when it started why it has not been able to be sort of stop these are the questions that you must ask then i must also share you the second set of empirical facts there are a lot of what bhagat has called it competing narratives there is a lot of confusions and silences unexpected ones from the day one if you flick through it some people say for example you ask a very pure question who is in charge of manipur's low energy problem who is in charge is it cm biren who is in charge of the pro- of the state of manipur is it the government of manipur or is it the government of india who is in charge of manipur do we have a clear cut answer on this why is that in a federal structure like this why we are not able to say that siri biren singh and the government of manipur is in charge of the law and order situation in manipur because right from the day one a confusion has been created you said article 355 has been imposed and some later on then people say it is not when the top journalist in this country is giving lectures on media saying that 355 has been imposed and after some time you realize that it is not then you also ask was the dcp removed by the government of manipur or is it on the advice and instruction of the new delhi do you have a clear picture on this who is sending this armed forces is it the requisition from the state government requesting the union government to send the army or the defense forces or security forces or is it the government of india who are sending these forces without those advice have we asked this question ever we don't we don't know the home minister says on the floor of the parliament that the cm is cooperating what does that mean jo kahega wo karega wahi cooperation hota hai ke nahi so who's calling the shot is it our own representative who's who swear by indian constitution as mlas and ministers are they in charge of it or is it new delhi in charge of it or is there a jugalbandi between these two and creating a confusions so that this violence can continue do we ask these questions no you are very good at blaming biren manipur government you are interested maitai government biren and you become a target without even clarifying these issues whether he is actually in charge of the state of manipur or not on the other hand are you able to blame the government of india no because there is a facade of a government there so they will say that this is the state government we are caught not only in violence but in this confusions saying something doing something else and we keep on waiting and then you say solve the problem yourself is it my duty to solve this violence as a citizen if my life is threatened whose responsibility is to protect my life you tell me you're all university students and faculty members under article 12 if you remember that indian constitution chapters on fundamental rights it was defined vis-a-vis the state that is why it starts with article 12 which defines what is state it is the legislative assemblies and the parliament and the state government as well as the union government and executive these are what is defined as the state 
You're supposed to protect your life, your property, your dignity, your well-being. That is state's responsibility. That is why the state exists. In your theory, you must have learned on social contract theory. State of nature, everybody fighting against each other, and then through contract, you have the state. That's the state's responsibility. When a criminal has attacked you, it is the law enforcing agencies who are supposed to help you out and get justice. What, ha what has been happening in Manipur the last four months? Everybody is being left alone to defend themselves. There is no state. It is the villages, you can see any damn newspapers and media houses in this country flagging these facts. That there are village guards defending their villages. Is this state forces? Are these state agencies or civilians? Or the non-state actors. So the state has collapsed. There is no state. Everybody is left alone to defend themselves. Women get raped. People get killed. Their houses burn. And they said, you solve the problem. You talk to each other. Is this the way the state behave? What are we talking about? You learn in political science theories, in law, in human rights, in Supreme Court, Parliament, Assembly, Government. What are they supposed to do? They are supposed to protect your life as a citizen. And you say you talk to each other and dissolve. That's why in one of my articles, if you have read, I call it as a Hobbesian world. Nothing like this has happened in India. This is not your normal communal riots. People are armed to the teeth and defending themselves, their villages. And the media in this country of a democracy is celebrating the fact that citizens are armed and defending themselves. And you think there is court, there is army, there is police, there is government, there is a prime minister, there is a CM. When the state is supposed to be there for you, when the state is nowhere, and your media is talking about it day in, day out. That statelessness is a reality in Manipur. You're left alone to defend your life. Rehabilitation, even citizens are pulling in money to help them. How many of you know this, especially from Manipur? Some of you must have contributed your monies and so on to help those citizens. Whose responsibility is this? Do we need a state or a non-state sort of a uh, state of nature? Do you want this Hobbesian world to exist? This moral questions that there is an abject failure of the state is something that some people have somehow managed to divert and create conflict and confusions by blaming one community or the other community. We are caught in this blame game of the community each other. What you see in Manipur is nothing but statelessness. It's a Hobbesian world. It is not the state institutions which is securing your life, which is supposed to be done under the constitution of the country. It is the citizen themselves trying to secure their life by arming themselves. How did this great country allow that? Have you ever asked or heard this question being raised in any of this national media? Have you? No. Rather, they have become part of the conflict. Spreading falsehood, taking sides. That's how all this great national media is doing. For the record, I must keep it straight here. For the local newspaper getting bias, in some sense, understandable, not justifiable. I repeat, it is understandable, but not justifiable. Why I do say that this is understandable? 
because they are in that conflict situation. They are part of a conflict dynamics in that state. So if the local media somehow gets biased, for instance, which I am doing it with a team of my uh, researchers, you will see some other things as well. But what will you explain the national media who's sitting in Delhi, in Chennai, what stake do they have to be part of the conflict? To be biased? I can understand cookies or mites or a newspaper in Manipur getting twisted and influenced by what has gone been going on there and not able to stick to strictly speaking certain objective style of reporting and so on. One might be able to understand that. But again, not justifiable. But please tell me, how will you explain national media and national body like Editor Guild of India producing twisted reports, factually incorrect, which everybody is here. Everybody can check. What stake do they have? These are some of the fundamental questions the rest of the country must ask. Do not think that this is going on in a remote country or remote part of this country. And I have been saying this from the day one. Why is the government of India silent? Is some of you who have seen my interviews right from May onwards. And I have said, even Indira Gandhi's example I gave. When something happened in the then East Pakistan, she says, I can't be a mute spectator to what's going on on this human tragedy in that place. Don't expect India to be a silent spectator. That's Indira Gandhi said. I've said this on a national media. Why is that the na national government is not able to do anything on this? Ask another question. You have blooded violence, slaughtering, cutting off women's belly, taking out the fetus and cutting it to pieces. Terrible violence have reported from Gujarat or any other sites where you have communal violence. Communal violence is a cancerous element in this country right from the day one. It was born out of communal violence called partition. The legacy still continues. But have you ever seen Muslim being shifted out from one area and ghettoized in one area, Hindu from one area to ghettoized on another, or the Sikhs from certain areas and put it somewhere, or ex caste from certain locality to some other locality, have you ever seen the transfer of population from one place to the another by the state? Have you ever seen this? Why this silence? Have you ever seen in this country? Then why is that you're doing that in Manipur? What is your game plan? Is that state different? You think that the citizens of this country can be ghettoized based on their language, on based on their religion, their ethnicity or tribal identities? There could be ghettoized enclave of this population? This is the other side of the same question. Why is that the Indian state is not able to stop this violence? Besides the silences. We have not asked questions. It's not a joke. People are losing lives. Their homes, thousands of them. You have never seen such kind of thing in this country. And the rest of the country taking sides rather than fundamentally worried about these issues. The basic question has not been asked. Ask this question. Why is, who is in charge of this law and order government? Is it a tactical move to avoid the blame game? That if you remove one government, then the whole blame will come on another government? 
Is it a jugalbandi between these two? Who is in charge of this law and order situation? Is it the requisition coming from the state government to send in troops to control it? Is the transfer and the removal of the DZ and so on has been affected by the CM or something else? What is this federal structure in this country? What is state supposed to do? These are fundamental questions that we must ask. You think that this transfer of population has happened in this country? You said, no, you haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. The only thing that I'm aware is the creation of Pakistan and India, where this thing had happened. So are you trying to create a communally grounded project of territorial ghettos resided by certain specific communities, and this country is going to celebrate that. In the name of tribal rights, in the name of self-determination, are you going to do this violence? Do you expect us to do this? Next time, if there is any damn violence in this country, ask them to ship the population from one area to the another. Give all the six in one group, because there is a violence between Hindus and Sikhs. Ship the entire Muslim onto one ghetto-wise locality and, and keep them up. What is this Indian state has been doing it? Why we should not be asking these questions? Is it international to ask this question? Please tell me, you are citizens, your voice is important. Is it anti-national to ask this question? Is it a rightful question that a citizen, thinking citizen, must be asking this? Begin asking these questions. It's too much. Four months. Look at those people. I have seen one guy who is talking from a relief camp. It hits here. He says he wants to commit suicide. You and I can go back after this meeting and sleep in a proper place. We will not miss our dinners. There are thousands of them, 60, 70 thousand people without homes in Manipur now. What do we do about this? That is the question that we must ask. There are issues that I have already spoken about, which I, in I don't intend to repeat it here. There are a lot of misgivings about your valleys and hills and minority and majority. Think about this. What is the population of Maitai? They said on, on uh, news portals and so on. You must be hearing this quite often. What is the population percentage of Maitai in Manipur? Please tell me. Some people say 53. You must have heard famous journalists repeating this. 53% maitres, 53% maitres. That's the 19, uh, 2011 census based on the language spoken. It includes non maitres who speak maitres alone as their mother tongue, such so as Pangals. So if you subtract those percentages, maitres' population actually is around something between 43 to 45%. What is the tribal population's percentage in Manipur? 40 point three three around that. So 40 versus 45 or 40 versus 43. How do you make sense of minority and majority here? What is the population of Muslim in this country for them to be called a minority, largest minority? Fourteen, fifteen percent versus 80%, that makes sense to call something as minority. And you box in this 43% in less than 10% of the land, and you think that they, they, they are not dispossessed. You think they are majority. And you think there are 40 seats. Is it Maitai seat or is it unreserved general seat? What did Indian constitution say? that you must reserve it for ST and SC proportionate to their population. 
So in this country, in parliament, for example, you have around about 8.6% of the seat is reserved in Lok Sabha because that is roughly the proportion of ST in this country. In Manipur, you reserve 19 seats for ST, not 20. People get confused on this. Kangpokpi is not a reserved seat. That's why in 1980, Kisor Thapa, a Nepali, won the election. So there are 19 seats reserved for ST. It is based on 1961 population, which is similar, 31% of the tribal population in that state. Was it done by Maitai? Is it designed by Maitai? It is a constitutional scheme. So there are experts in these countries, fed by some of these communal sectarian forces, and they said it's Maitai, as if this is done by Maitais. And said it should be 50-50%. Did they ever raise this question in any other states where you have AC reservation seats? Have you ever heard? No. Do you see, if you go by such a report, which was instituted by Manmohan Singh government, on the status of Muslim in this country after 50 years of independence, what is their socioeconomic structure's status right now? What their representation in bureaucracy and other parliament and so on? And they discovered that it is not properly represented. You use the same criteria. Are they represented proportionally to the assembly of the state? Yes. 31% reserve seat, 19 seats out of the 60. And it is not done by Maitais. It is the constitution of India's mandate. Why your communal? You are looking from a communal reins and as if it is done by Maitais and you say 50-50%. Then Karo, entire country may. And you say, how many of them, you see in such a report, how many of the Muslims are there in the bureaucracy? Check in Manipur, how many of them in this top echelons of the bureaucracy in the decision-making structure? Some report says in the government of India, there is one or two ST secretary level officers in the union government. There are 8% of the population is represented barely by one or two secretaries. In Manipur, do you know what is the representation in the bureaucracy? Please check it. You will see and do a comparison between Mizoram and Nagaland. And see in Nagaland you have something called the Eastern Nagalands. They are also demanding because of their not represented and so on. How many of the Nagas from the Eastern Nagaland is represented in bureaucracy and decision making process of the state and their cabinet minister in union government and do a comparative study with Manipur? These are factual, objective ways of looking at it. Does it mean that there is no differential development patterns in the state? Or that there cannot be any differential developments among different communities in the state? There could be. So how do you solve that? Do an objective assessment form a committee like such a committee and then investigate how many of the, which of the community has how many graduates, what is their mortality rate, what is their infant mortality, maternal mortality rate, literacy rate, their presence in the bureaucracy in academia. Find it out first without communalizing this entire debate. Then we will try to make a corrective step. If you are genuinely concerned about solving real issues, then you don't need violence. You don't need falsehood to be propagated. That is the thing that we should be asking. For too long, we have allowed this. And the fall squarely lies with our political leadership. If you have a grievances among your people, you should have addressed that long time back. Sharing the spoil of the state's economy, 
contract and percentage cuts, propping up your men and transfer and this and that. You're obsessed with that wall. So who's getting benefit out of this conflict? You want to prop up some of your politician as a savior of X community? Some politician as the champion of Y community? And all along, these guys have been sitting together. Look at their wealth. Is the ordinary people are suffering. Do you think that these people who have been slaughtered and who have been thrown out of their homes are any of those elites in the, in, in the society? Why is that our intellectual class cutting across community raises such questions? If there is a landslide, will you form a committee to investigate whether it is done by the Maitais? These are the issues that you and I must ask. And I must end, as I always love to do it, look at within ourselves. We have a lot of things to correct ourselves. Bhagat has already flecked out one of them. Who is a Maite? Who represents Manipur? What is our relationship with Manipur? We don't even know whether Manipur is a hill state or a not. Basic geography, you don't even get a clear picture. You want to see what is Manipur? You think about singular sense, you only talk about one valley, right? I would like to share you a picture. Just see what is the valley and Manipur. People say valley and hill go separate karo kind of thing. What is the nature of that hill and valley? Just check, check this video. Can you play that? This is Chapur headquarters. This is the southern tip of the oval shaped valley of Manipur, the central valley. Is it a hill? Check Churachampur. Can you switch off this light? Just wait. Hmm? Oh, is it a pointer here? Let's start from that. How do you own this? See, this, uh, can you pull up, can you pull it up first? Back, back. You know this is Kangla, in the heart of Imphal, and above sea level this is 811 meters above sea level. No, no, that's okay, I can speak. Can you see this? 811 meters. Churan Champur Hill, the town. Just see. This is Kangla. This is the central valley of Manipur. And this, this is Lokta. You go straight. This is Churan Champur. Is it hill? What is the height? Less than? One, around 100 meters difference. You see, that is, this is not the only valley. This is valley. It's the southern tip of the Oval Sev Valley of Manipur. So you have an idea of hill and the valley. What is this hill and valley? Think about this. Check it. This is the northern tip, Kangpuk P. What is his height? This is all from Google's and in official data. The average and some sites we have taken. This is Kaupum Valley. What is his height? The difference is 10 meters. Is it hill? It is part of Nona district as a hill. Check it. This is Sajik Tampa in Chandil. What is the height? Which is taller or higher? Is it Kangla or this one? Kangla is one meter higher. And this is hill. You understand this? So what is this hill and valley that we have been talking for decades? Check it. This is Chandil. What is that? 960. By the way, Chandil used to be part of the central district of Manipur.
Tandil, Tenglopal, and Chapikarong used to be part of the central district of Manipur, which is Imphal, Bishnupur. Today is all split. This is Chapikarong. This is, there yeah, are three places. These were also part of the central district of Manipur. This is 890. And we have been living with this idea of as if there is one single valley and the rest is hill. But look at the entire Manipur. If you can afford this, see, you have the other video. This is Moray is, is the plain on the other side and you have the GD on the other side. Just fast forward and let me see. This is the central valley. Turan Champur is this, the southern tip. Kangpukri is this, northern tip. Then this is the Kaupum Valley. Can you see this? Uh, the Chapi Karong and Chandel all are here. So there are multiple valleys. Why is that? Because in a mountainous region, you have valleys. Do you have valley in Chandigarh? Is there valley in Chandigarh? Is there valley in Lucknow? Why? Because that's a plain. That's why we call it Indo-Gangetic plain. Valley is a topographical reason in a mountainous reason. So by definition, valley is part of a hilly terrain. It is not outside of it. If you check it, you know, uh, some of the states form by separating the hills from the valley. Uh, this is Uttarakhand. This used to be part of UP. This is a Shivalik region. So from the plains of the things, it's been separated. But look at the difference. 1,700 meters. This is the, wait, hold on. Lowest, you know, in Himalayan, this Shawalik region is the, uh, you know, the lowest region. This is 1,700 meter. And if you see Allahabad and Lucknow, these are around 100 meters. So different is 1,000 plus. It is 17 times higher. And then, where is that other one? Uh, what is this? This is Nagalin. This is the mountainous terrain. It's continuing same Manipur. This is Dimapur plain area. And you see that this side is higher and this is lower. So therefore in Nagalin, all the river flows from this side. Like this. And you see this is, uh, this 610 is this range. And 1800 to 2000 is this side, eastern range. Okay, so you see that when Assam Valley, this is the valley area, when this was curved out, there is a geographical distinctive features which have been removed. You see that it is part of what we call it Eastern Himalayas. So you, and Brahmaputra Valley is part of the Indo-Gangetic Plain. So you, you have this geographical distinctiveness, but if you see in Manipur, as the picture is completely different because like here you have Dimapur, and Kohima can have a relationship, and you think Manipur and Churan Champur cannot have a relationship because they are hill and valley. You see, that's a kind of a false narrative has been going on. And mind you, people, the majority people who stay here speaks a language which belongs to Indo-Aryan language. And here is Tibeto Burmese family. Manipur. All of us belong to the same linguistic family. Not only we belong to the same mountainous terrain, where the hill and valleys are part of the same topographical reason. That's why I said, is there a valley in Chandigarh? Is there a valley in Lucknow? Because that by definition, valley is part of that. Kangra Valley you have in Himachal Pradesh, for example. So valley is an inherently a part of a mountainous region, and you talk as if, the relationship between Brahmaputra Valley and Naga Hills is the same as the relationship between Imphal and Sajik Tampak or you know, Chandel or you know, Chiran Champur and so on. Can you see the false perspective that have been imposed in the same people? And then you are saying, here you wanted to do a partition and unheard of things in India, you ghettoize community enclaves, you are creating it. You, you stop it, it's okay. Yeah, you can close it. So what I am saying is there are many things that we also even don't know ourselves. We need to have a clarity of these ideas and a history of this land if you're really sick. 
This is something that I must share with you as I try to wind it up here. How India was born in 1947. You have to look at British Indian Empire. And in British Indian Empire, there were two parts. Broadly, the territories were broadly two parts. One is called British India. The other is called Native States. Some of them are called Indian States. British love to call it as princely states because for them there can be only one king. That's the king of England. Bakika is prince, lower status. That's why it is called princely states. So what happened is the Indian Republic that you and I are a member of today was born out of an amalgamation of those Indian states and British India. And there were 600 roughly around states. And one of those states is the state of Manipur. You must understand this. There's something that I want to share with you. These states join together to form this country. They are not created by this state. Manipur was not created by the Indian state. Manipur was a state which joins and constituted the Indian Republic, like many other princely states. Some of them have been merged together with so many other areas and the states were formed. Till recently, there were only three of those states with their territories intact. One of them is Jammu and Kashmir, another is Manipur, the other one is Tripura. Jammu and Kashmir is destroyed, it's been broken up. And this is the second state which I suspect some people are trying to break up. And you must calculate why some people would love to break up this and then create blood seed in an organically connected landscape. The intimacy between valley and its, its higher reasons, the, what we call hills, is an organic relationship. And community which are so embedded with each other, not only in marital relationship and so on, but even in settlement patterns. And you are trying to tear that apart through false dichotomies and narratives. And you are asked to fight among each other. This entire region of the Northeast is swept by neoliberal economic forces. We are nothing. There are few lakhs of population, few crores if you combine all, all together, Indian Northeast. Much more larger corporate capitals geostrategy calculations. We are nothing but bones. Your blood, your cries, your pain seems to be less important to the larger goal. If it is not, I dare those people who have power show us, stop this violence. If you have the power, if you have the concern for these people, stop the violence. Don't play dirty games. For your larger game, making people fight, giving false ideas, hopes and aspirations. You know that some people were promised that your demand will be satisfied, help us in election. Have you come across that? Some cookie organization said, you know, we have a tie-up with BJP from rebel groups. Is this an effort to implement those promises? Is it a process to uh, solve the armed groups who have been refusing to talk to the Indian state by sucking them inside as this, this, this conflict prolongs? Is it a process that once you create this kind of a violence, 
then reprocement and reconciliation becomes tougher and tougher and tougher. The longer the violence, the more grotesque the violence, the more terrible is the violence, reprocement will be difficult more and more. Is that what you're trying to do in our state? What are we going to do? So my idea is this. I love this. Because to be a humanity, a part of human beings and humanity and so on, I think you first have to be yourself. If you cannot even identify with the pains of your own community and your cognate communities living together, don't tell me that you can be a humanist. You can be only a humanist when you understand the pains of the maitais, the pains of the cookies and joe. And you realize what is the common destiny that we have. If you can have moved beyond this parochial identity politics, and if you think this violence is something that will pay, I can promise you, for a mountainous person who live and for ecology, I have been saying this, Maitais, we think that we are like, as if we are like the Ahomias or the UPIs come from the plain. No, we are not. You ask your child to draw a sunrise and sunset, unlike people in Mumbai, they will probably draw a pictures with the hills at the background. Why? Because that's the ecology where they live. And when you think about romance, look at the poems and the songs. Chingya Luya, Ching Sang Pareng, you know, this is part of your romantic imagination. Your livelihood. Ching the Kaduna Sing Chanba, Pat the Kumduna Long Konba. Why are you saying like this? Because it shows that you are a creature of that ecological system of mountains and the lakes and the valleys and the rivers. You're not from the plains. And then, you know, there's an interesting thing which was told to me recently by a junior of mine who settled down in the US. He said, Tamo, you know, we always love to put echo in our songs. So he said, Tamo, you are right. Because one of these American friends asked told me something that is eye-opening. He said, he just asked him when he said, you know, I love echo in my songs. This American asked him, are you originally from a mountainous region? Only then he understood. Why we prefer echo is because we come from a mountainous terrain where you can hear these echo sounds. That's why we have a preference for a slight echo in our songs and musics. Why I'm saying this, many of the Maitais have lived with a contradiction without realizing that they are a hilly creature. You are born of that mountainous ecology. So asking you to be separate, separated from that ecological system and box in into a false category is asking you to die. So fight for us is existential. And I must end this with this, with this remark. And I'm proud of Manipur for one more reason. In a globalized world today, your parochial identities cannot be the deciding factors. All other movements in the Northeast tend to be ethno-nationalist, narrowed idea of certain ethnicity and so on. Manipur is the only entity that gives you a hope beyond that because by definition, the idea of Manipur and a united Manipur cannot be defended on ethnocentric ideas. It has to be an idea where every communities can live with dignity and peace. It is a fact of our life. It cannot be based on some imperial nostalgia of certain ethnic groups that may take tend to suffer from, at least some of us. It cannot be based on exclusivity 
and sectarian ideologies of tribal identities. A united Manipur has to be defended on the principle of uh, an idea where we can beyond this ethnic thing. I'm not denying that each community is important, just as I already said that you cannot be a humanist until unless you understand your own community. So we must have an idea of United Manipur not to be defended on a majoritarian imperial nostalgia or some ethno-nationalist idea or tribal sectarianism. We must find a common ground and that is why each one of us must start asking crucial questions. Do not fall trap into this mayhem, but as I started it, it is equally important for you to be assertive when people started telling lies about you and your communities. Then you must stand up yourself, but without being aggressive towards the others. And that's the only way to move forward. And I request through this, each one of us must ask critical questions. And I think the government of India must take the right kind of decisions. It is embarrassing for them not to do that. If I believe that the ice can be broken, if the prime minister, for instance, order all his MLAs to come to Delhi and talk, whichever community you come from, do you think that if the prime ministers call these MLAs, they will not come? Tell me. If the Prime Minister called all the MLAs belonging to his party, do you think that some will come, not come? Let them sit in a room, talk, don't throw this solution to the people. The government must take the initiative and please do this. Otherwise, this mayhem will linger on for a long time. Don't threaten that, you know, you will lose lives and a lot of Maite women will be killed. I think, I must say that, I had to say something that I hold it very firmly. Manipur is not Kashmir. A lot of people will die if you try to make a muscle flexing approach. And those people will be Maite and majority of them will be our women. And if that bloodshed happened, the consequence of that one for the days to come will neither be good for India nor for that part of the countries. Remember, there are Maitais outside the state of Manipur. So please do not take people for granted. We as a citizen must ask critical questions. The state must come in, impose its writ, do justice to people who are, have grievances. At the same time, I also appeal to people of my tribe who are called academics, not to indulge in propagandist hate speeches. Check, don't tell lies. Whatever I say, it's not that it's gospel truth. There could be mistakes. But I believe that so far what I've been saying is two things that to understand the collective good for all of us, state must take responsibility squarely, and we must remember that we can't, we can't keep fighting. And enough of bloodshed has already happened. It's time I want to see from the other camp as well, intellectuals speaking up for peace and dialogue rather than accusings and hoping that certain kind of sectarian project will be fulfilled by indulging in violence. That's the only thing that they must realize. And for my days, please remember, when your forefathers were doing Satyagraha and peaceful demonstration for statehood, there was violence in Nagaland, Naga Hills, and a state was created. As if violence pays in this country. Do not repeat the similar kind of thing by simply indulging in violence. You will fulfill some demand. You should not encourage violence. And that is one message that I want to give through this. For the rest of us, especially from outside my home state, please ask critical questions. Please question these institutions like media houses in the government of India, not to be silent spectator, 
or take sides or partisan positions on this conflict. Because if you believe that Manipuris are part of this country, then you should be equally worried that such a thing which has never happened in this country, why it has been allowed to linger on for so long. The day you started asking, you are doing a good service to yourself as a citizen of this country. Thank you all. Thank you so much, sir, for your very well detailed touching and moving address and for your advice. Your words will echo amongst us. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now approaching to the last part of the program, the QA session. I would like to keep the QA session open and request respected audience to put up, put, to put up their queries at, to our speakers. We have a dedicated mic for your questions. Please come forward and introduce yourself. Kindly mention to whom your questions is being addressed to. Tin Birimba Mayam Gimara Mapamda, Wapama Matam Jage, Madudi, Mayamna, Akwegi, Manipuri Londa, Question Hang Biraga Suyagani, Hang Biba Matamda, Isagi Ming, Amadi, Karamba, Juri, the Hang Bigani, Hibo to Sut, Hambiram Nabat Nixing Jerry. I would like to request Mr. Marlin Blystrom to coordinate and manage the QA session from the audience. Amarjit sir. Uh, good afternoon, sir. My question is to Amarjit sir. So uh, you have talked about the geopolitics. So what made you consider Manipur is not important in geopolitics? As we know that uh, India is a, uh, right now a presidency of G20. Even G20 summit has been done in Manipur itself. So everyone says that Manipur is going to play a huge role in South-South connection in order to become India as a leader of the world. So what made you consider Manipur is not important in geopolitics? Thank you, sir. Okay. Whether Manipur is not important or not, I'm not saying that Manipur has not formed any important role in India's geopolitics. Modible, no? Yes. I'm not saying that Manipur has not played any significant roles in India's geopolitics. I think that it is important. I was also talking about how these states, other than Manipur's, has become an important part of geopolitics of India's. I know for many of us, we think that Manipur has lessened its importance in India's geopolitics because Myanmar is in crisis. Military junta is there. And we were thinking that India has moved away from, from Manipur to Mijoram, Mijoram to Tripura, to Chittagong Hill, to Bay of Bengal. And many of us think that whole geopolitics has shifted to Bay of Bengal. You must listen that right in, I think it was during the, con during the violence, Indian foreign policy when he was visiting Southeast Asia, has again emphasized the trial, uh, again, uh, treaties and others, uh, diplomatic relation with Myanmar also. I was thinking about, I was not saying that Manifu is not important. Manifu is, is still important. I was actually asking these questions whether India has more other places, other states which have become more important to its geopolitics, and because of this, it has to be. And we also know that Manipur, not all Manipur may not be significant to Indian geopolitics also. We also ask question that if not, is it some part of Manipur has become important in India's geopolitics? Not all. 
that is also a question that we have been asking yes we we might we always think that the the, the, the indo myanmar trade that all that car rallies that from manipur to thailand that we were all dreaming has not been taken up but it doesn't mean that manipur is not significant it's still significant i was reading this questions whether there are other factors like increasing importance of bay of bengal the chinese involved in bay of bengal but in importance of bangladesh in india geopolitics global geopolitics importance of south china sea indian ocean region has those factors is it those factors those factor come into play however the death factor come to play in not i mean in in the sort of state not acting any dealing doing any proactive action to is well whether in the geopolitical calculation of india whether those calculation have stopped india to sort of exercise its rights to end the violence in manipur these are these are our uh, these other talks these are speculation these are all hypotheses and i don't mean the manipur is not manipur is important if not all certain part of manipur has become more important in the same time that's the point i was saying uh hello sir uh, sir my name is rastam and i am a research scholar from department of physical education uh, sir my question is to uh, sir uh, my question is to bimo sir uh, so you have said the nature of the government both in the center and the state sir uh, we can even see we can even hear what's going on even in our own assembly uh, like one day assembly and all and uh, it's very emotionally touched to the youth of this nation so in such a havoc state what as per your suggestion what will be the role and duties as a youth of this state of of the state of manipur and of the state of a youth of this nation sir thank you now this is what i said you know you need to ask critical questions look you know you, you see uh in, <clears throat> if i give you an example from physics you know warner heisenberg once said that it is not nature itself that we see but nature is exposed to our method of questioning matlab ki whatever you know is contingent upon the kind of question that you raise so i think the fundamental question that you must ask is why is the state abandon its its responsibility i've already told you that in indian fundamental rights uh, which is enshrined in the constitution starts with article 12 by defining what is state because all other right is an obligation imposed on the state to protect the life freedom dignity of the individuals that the state must ensure now what has happened in manipur is that the state is not ensuring that we are defending and then indian national media is showing that villages are guarding their own villages iska matlab kya hai it is not the state which is protecting them it is the citizen themselves so everybody is fighting uh and then there is also you know unfortunately an air of hatred all around which will affect us in the end of the day i think amarjit has already hinted in his talk a uh, normalization of violence you know that if you hate someone that becomes part of your personality as well you understand so uh, too much of un- uh, unacceptable hatred has been also been in the air in the state uh, the fact that the state has not acted upon it there is a complete abdication of responsibility of the state i don't need to say this it is there for everybody to see the only thing is that we have not raised these questions ulta we are asking cookies and maitais and cookies and maitais as a fantastic way of you know it somebody is also something that people ask whenever such kind of thing happen and we must fundamentally ask 
who gets benefit out of this violence? Then you will see the answers. When you have this statelessness, who's getting advantage of this one? Who's going to get benefit? Some people think that they are going to get separate administration. What is that Maita is expecting? No, no, I'm saying it, what this violence is going to pay them. You know, just think about it, this one, and then you will see. Why is it the Indian state is not stopping this? What is that Indian state has interest in this? Ye kavi kavi ye lagta hai na, there's uh, Chanakya Kotilya. You know, seemingly he had said something very interesting. That you try to convince some people, if you cannot, make them confuse. I think that is what, they know that the people of Manipur cannot be convinced on certain political projects. So the best thing is that confuse them and create situation where uh, those political projects can be presented as inevitable. You see, that's the kind of a policy that I sense. Uh, so, you know, as a youth, two things is that ask critical questions and also try to see what is good for us as a society uh, and, and what can be the implications of this conflict in our life in the days to come, uh, that needs to be reflected upon very critically. And at the moment, I see an energy among the people, every middle class who are otherwise not concerned about the state seems to feel something about it. I think that energy is there, I can see that. And uh, if we don't channelize it properly, we will be uh, losing an historical moment. For me, I have been saying this, every crisis is an opportunity for growth. And it, either at the level of the individual or at the level of the collective. It's a time that you will come to know your weaknesses and your, your strength. If you have a financial crisis, if you have a relationship crisis, whatever kind of crisis you have, you know, how you respond to that will tell you what is your strength and what is your weakness. So this crisis for me is a moment where um, the people of the state and particularly the Maitais must rethink about various categories through which they have been looking at it and to reinvent themselves, fight back against our own weaknesses, don't hide it, and then the augment and strengthen our strength and craft a, a future. So this crisis, you should not be intimidated or, 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 or sort of bogged down by this. Uh, take this crisis as an opportunity to reinvent ourselves for a better Manipur. I think that's what the youth should have in your mind. Uh, hello, hello to the panelists. Uh, very thank you for the wonderful uh, session. And uh, I have uh, two questions uh, for both the panelists. Uh, my first question. Uh, is posed towards uh, Professor Bimal, uh, and uh, my second uh, second question is uh, posed towards Professor Amarzid. So the first question here is uh, for Bimal sir. Uh, it's that like uh, I was just wondering. I am not a native of uh, Manipur. I am a native of Assam, and I have been closely following the uh, instances of Manipur, and it really concerns me. And I have traveled all the way from Delhi to uh, attend this uh, talk. And uh, Bimal sir, I was just wondering that as an individual, I mean, as uh, you know, liter literate beings, I mean, I would not call or consider myself educated because the meaning of education, educated or you know, education is totally different. I would just consider myself as a literate. It is very, it is such a subjective term. So considering that, do we really need to, uh, you know, engage in, uh, a process of self dialogue when we think you know ethnically how we think ethnically really matters because at times we assert our identities as an you know as belonging to a particular ethnic community so i feel that as literates do we as literates and 
as, uh, as scholars or as students, as engage, continuously engaging with uh, you know such um, complex topics. So do you think that we really need this self dialogue when we think ethnically, so that we you know come out of that you know negative zone of considering yourself to be you know uh, very distinct and you know uh, that is a bit problematic I feel because what binds us is the, the red blood that flows inside us. It's not our, you know, identity. I mean, that's how I look at it. It's my personal view. So I would just like to, you know, know how you think about it. Uh, thank you, sir. And my second question is towards uh, Amarjit, sir. So, sir, you were mentioning about state. So when you were mentioning about state and, you know, I was wondering that we usually read about, you know, talk about top-down ap approach, what the state has, you know, delivered to us. And uh, by uh, going through your talk, I was uh, thinking that why not focus, you know, now, this is the time to focus on down-to-top approach, you know, how we are, uh, you know, thinking, like whatever is we are receiving, how we are thinking about that, like, uh, are, are the things that we are receiving really, you know, working for us? Like, for example, separate administration. I'm, I am against separate administration because, you know, considering this unity in diversity, you know, you have to think that way. So, does this really work? And, you know, talking about autonom autonomous districts and all, I would not like to name the autonomous district now, but I have seen instances whereby there is an autonomous district and there has been no school in remote areas. So what kind of autonomous districts is this? Like, you know, what kind of empowerment is this? So, yeah, so I, I would like to know uh, more about this, how you view about this. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, thank you, Lokumini. Uh, this is my student, all the way coming from JNU to Sandiga. Anyway, uh, thanks for your questions. Uh, on your first question that you asked, Bimo, uh, dialogue with the self. Even if this is the paper or which I wrote for the Kukichin peoples. And there was a dialogue with the self, and so I was just remembering the how we need to engage with dialogue with the self. And of course, community has been in dialogue with itself while community contests each other. But somewhere that dialogue with, with ourselves has not given much space. Our dialogue has been somewhere, I think, hijacked. I would like to take this opportunity to say about this dialogue, then I will come to the autonomy. While I was looking at the Kukichin Joe people, across Manipur, Mijaram, and Chin Hills. And Kukichin peoples have been searching for the names for common, common name and common nomenclatures and common identity. They never come, they never able to come to that common name, common identity. Many people think this is, this is not, you know, some people, right? Ojati, or the Gangti will say, Kukichin people are the prisoner of themselves. They are not able to arrive to a common identities. I differ with that. The fact that they are not able to come to common identities and squeeze everyone into one. The fact that they have been negotiating, talking each other across clans, dialect, tribes and sub-tribe communities among the Caucasian people was a very positive factor in the age when everyone squeezed, tried to squeeze themselves, try to always look for singular identities or singular national states. I thought there was a dialogue. Look at the, look at the two texts, one written by T. Goggins about Joe Homeland. Look at another text on Jalingam. You'll find the dialogue between these two texts. One still talks about incomplete nations. There's a nation, but people still yet to accept it. People are engaging with itself. Whereas in Jalingam, it's already like we already have a nation, we already agreed it, we must fight for it. Look at these two peoples. They have been dialogue with others. I love the way, for instance, we must not forget to look at the many of some of us Kugi Chinjou scholars. Oza Kamket Tangs, who wrote about the Paitiers across India and Myanmar borders. Oza Gangti, who wrote about the cookies. Oza Gangti talks about Manipur as a national entities. Oza Gangti talks about how Kugi Chins were part of this Manipur shelf. Oza, Gang, Oza Kamket Tang talks about the Paitiers of of Indian, Indian parties and the Myanmar parties and how different set between the citizens. 
They're having dialogue with ourselves within among the communities. Somewhere that dialogue has either stopped or not given much space. Yes, we must be, have dialogue with ourselves. Not only that to the point that Bimol was saying that we must also be critique of ourselves. Both the communities, they must have critique to ourselves. I think they'll also open the window for shared uh, destiny or common reality between you. Once we look to yourself, while we look, when we look to yourself, you will also look to the world. On the question of to, why not we focus on how we reshape if you look at the top-down process. Yes, we must be looking at how we receive things. I would not say it's not about top-down process, how state is no more functioning with the top-down approach. Not, not complete top-down process, but where you'll find the top is in the down. There's already top center in the periphery, people say that. Many people part of the become part of it. Maybe because of development, development process, maybe because of various kind of schemes for people. I would say state and the communities, core and the periphery, which used to say also come together. But yet it's true that how we are receiving things, how we become part of the state making, our nation building, we must critique ourselves, we must engage ourselves. I understand that how, for instance, let's take about Article 241, 244 close one, close two, 244A, all refers to administration of tribal areas in Indian constitution. Reading all this constitution, reading all this provision which has come in how it becomes part of the constitutions. It becomes part of the constitution as a, as a sort of accommodation and integration of ethnic diversities. And accommodation and integration of diversities has it resolved the problems? Has six years old resolved the problem of ethnic issues? Has it able to completely integrate the peoples to the heart and mind of the nations? Or has it able to resolve, resolve differences that we are seeing among ethnic communities? While we read, while we assert our identity through the constitution provisions, we must also engage ourselves. What are things we are receiving it? We don't just receive, we reflect on that. We must tactically, we must skillfully use constitutional provisions. If there are laps, lap, uh, lapses or loopholes, we must identify it. We can, we can ask for an amendment. We can, of course, ask for amendment. We can ask for certain kind of new reforms and legislation, new legislations. We must reflect on what we have been receiving. And of course, you know, when you say what we receive, we talk about state, how we understand state. If you look at the history of North India, our community on, in, in Manipur, we dislike state as much as we like state. We love and hate states. In the head love and hate relation with the state, we are also being configured, we have been being set ourselves. Yes, we must reflect on what we receive. We must reflect because we must see the constitutional mechanism and provision, how that can work in terms of having a good relation among communities, how that may play hurdles in the intercommunity relationship, and how we can renegotiate and redebate our constitution provision if it is not empowering the people, if it is not helping the marginalized section of people to, to, to fully address problems. So we must reflect on what we are receiving. And I think we are not just merely receiving. We are also not receiving. We are not just receiving. We are not just receiver. We are also become the active claimants, active as active claimants of various identity and autonomy. I have said that autonomous districts. I can't deny, we can't say we don't, should not have autonomy. But we must agree how much autonomous region how much autonomy can a region afford? How much of autonomous at, that also based on groups and corporates this can a society offer? Uh, tell me how many autonomous state or how many autonomous region can solve the human problems, basic socioeconomic problems? I think it's time to re-debate ourselves existing autonomous mechanism, autonomy mechanism. 
Of course, by not denying the autonomy that each of us should have. We must have autonomy. Autonomous should be at various level. Giving autonomy to district or community is not even, if it is all granted. Community need to be open enough. There is need autonomy. Women need autonomy. Women need autonomy. Lesser tribe or community, tribal community need autonomy. We need autonomy to question the political representative. We need autonomy to question the, uh, the type of quality of life we are having. We need autonomy to question where has the money gone. We need to make the, any representative or accountable. We need to, ah, we need autonomy to question various state and non-state actors on matters that concerning the uh, welfare of peoples. We need various kind of autonomy, but we must also be time to discuss ethnic-based autonomy or what you call constitutional models. We need to debate it. I know many people suggest it's an effective meter as a way out to solve a problem. But the examples are not swaying in the good directions. We must debate on that. Thank you very much. See, uh, internal debate and self uh, requirement to move out of the ethnic is what is essential in any process. That's why you know, there are two things involved. When I speak, I don't have to deny that I'm a mighty. Okay, in the name of humanity and humanism and neutrality, you don't have to do that. First, recognize that you're a mighty, you're a Manipuri, you belong to that state. Uh, and, and, that's, and then also realize how you feel. All these things are important. If you come from social science, then you will know there's something called reflexivity. So I know where I'm coming from, to constantly have a negotiation with yourself. And that is uh, essential for you to have some clarity in life, where this is coming from. So that's why I said I am here as a mate, but when I speak, you will see that I talk about the imperial nostalgia that some might suffer from. This can only come when you are able to have a negotiations, a critical appraisal of yourself. You know, you as a community, why do we think the way we think? There are a lot of things that I have written about my society, and I still insist, much of my intervention so far is if you see that my comment will be more than 90% is on what we as might ought to do rather than criticizing or attacking the other communities. If you see in the last four months of whatever I've written, whatever I've spoken out, the undercurrent of my speech is primarily my own community. Sharing, expressing what we are going through and what should we do about it and also realize what are our weaknesses. I have been mentioning that. Uh, I have written this for years on. See, I tell you, around 2003, 4, I I've started writing, and you can see some of my writings on that. I have called the way, say, Manipur history is written is nothing but monochromatic history. It's not only state-centric, but it is also a meta-centric way of writing history. So you should have alternative ways of writing history. If you're a history student, you will know, for instance, what this subaltern historians are saying that you should be able to recover some of this history. But unfortunately, some of the intellectuals uh, and academics uh, become more of a propagandist and head mongers. In this conflict, you can see telling lies. You said something in, in one newspaper article, uh, and then after a few weeks, you write something else. And then you are a professor of a university and your hatred for Maita uh, is so much that it flows out from your argument. And that I think is a lack of honesty. It is both intellectual lack of honesty as well as a human being. Uh, and it's okay. I can understand that some intellectuals become the spokesperson for a particular political project is well and good. So, I mean, I need to contest. As Amarjit is saying, for instance, what is this autonomy all about? Does it pay? What the experiences of autonomy, uh, autonomy in India is like? How is the six schedule function in uh, Meghalaya? How is the Bodo Autonomous Council functions? 
You can see whether uh, what was expe expected of that institution, whether it is functioning or not. And uh, in globally also, if you see, he cited some of them, uh, criticism against the consociational model uh, on an identity base, you will create another majority within the same thing, you know? So ultimately, what kind of principle you should follow? Uh, if it is autonomy, I am all for decentralizations. I have no doubt about that, but it has to be at, at uh, or, you know, possibly in all layers of the uh, state structure, it has to be done. It cannot be uh, decentralized uh, to the whims and fancies of certain exclusivist sectarian ideology, some disintegrationist sectarian ideology. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a bad logic. You know, that is where you are saying about one's, two offices with one's own ethnic group or tribal, then you don't, you don't have the capacity to live with others. And in and, 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 and human existence, if you lose your capacity to live with others, that essentially you mean that you are working against the basic essence of human being. We are a relational being. It doesn't make sense, you know, cookies and mates can't live together. Is it okay if, it, if in this university that no cookie student is going to join the Punjab University because there are Maitai faculty members here? Is it that the cookies will not uh, follow orders from uh, uh, Maitai army officers? Or is it that you can't join a company if there is a Maitai? This is nonsense. I know you should. It's okay. You can fight. You can be differences. You don't need to flatten society. I am, I am all for differences. And you should celebrate it. But it should not lead to detrimental, uh, you know, uh, developments on, on the way we exist in this world of globalized world and a very exclusivist, disintegrationist, sectarian ideology. Uh, I, I don't support that. For me, as that's, that's why when I, I take the stand, of course, it will hurt the community or those who follow that ideology. Uh, that's inevitable. Uh, but this is an opportunity for dialogue. I said, this is not done. What you wanted to achieve with separate administration will not work. It can be done other way around. And what are the other common factors between you and me that we should work together? And this is the kind of attitude that you should have it. Although, unfortunately, some of the utterances is uh, uh, completely unacceptable and it will harm, not my taste, it will harm these people as well. Believe me, you can't have this. Once you have this hatred and sectarian ideology deep inside you, this becomes the defining characteristic of yourself. So I think uh, that self-interrogation is important that one should move out of it. Uh, I think, uh, I believe that at least among the Maitais, we also have a tough time. You know, when I say Maitais have suffered from imperial nostalgia, it may not be a, a music to some of the Maitais. When I say too much ethnocentrism among the Maitais is bad, not only for us, but for the state of Manipur, I dare to say that. The important question is, uh, you don't get to see this from many other communities, especially right now who are involved in this conflict. Uh, you know, so you're right. I, I wish that more of us uh, cutting across community has this capacity to have an interrogation about their own stand and think beyond it. Right now, emotionally so charged, I can understand some of them are quiet. But I think uh, the development is much more than these communities. For me, the number one thing in my focus is the Indian state. Why is the Indian state is allowing this to happen for so long? Why there is a confusion among these who is in charge of the state? And why certain, you know, why is government of India prime minister is silent for so long? If they wanted to do it, and, and why is that uh, some media houses in the so-called national level become partisan in their approach? I can understand people getting bias back home in Manipur, but what stake do they have it here? Rather than dousing the flame, they're, they're fueling this conflict. 
I have said this in my interviews before as well. So unfortunately, the legacy still continues. The latest one to hit me hard is, is the Editor Guild of India's report. I don't know whether they are embarrassed or not. When you have been, the inaccuracies and factual mistakes have been pointed out, you should have the honesty and modesty to accept, the humility to accept that we made mistakes, but I don't see that coming in still. That's very unfortunate. That, that these are some of the things that critical self appraisal is required by the Indian media and the so-called mainstream population in this country. This is not a tamasa to be watched on television. You know, it's, unfortunately, I must tell you this also today, I may it. Uh, irreconcilable differences. This is a word that you get to hear, right? As in the deep distrust among these communities. It's, I'm sorry to say this, but that was what the colonial forces have said about the Hindus and Muslims in South Asia. These people are inherently antagonistic to each other, irreconcilable communities. The separation is the only option kind of thing. If the Indians have problem with that assessment as a colonial framing, then we should avoid doing the same thing when it comes to, there is nothing inevitable, natural about the animosity among the people in the state. This is created and manufactured. Due to time constraint, we have time for just for one question, please. Good evening, sir. Actually, my name is Benazir Sana Yungkhaiba, and I am the president of the Student Council of MCM Devi College. I have come here with lots of my friends, and uh, I just have a personal question, and I don't think it would be, I was asking if it would be critical or not, but to me it's a personal question. So I've been wondering that, uh, I've been asking myself a lot of questions like, do we need a mediator to act as a, uh, like, uh, to solve the problem between the two communities and till now I cannot name even a single person who's able to make the solution to be like to both the communities to be calmed down and I've been asking a questions like is there a need of a leader that can have the charismatic personality to even influence the national government and till now my question my answer has not been answered so I just want sir to give me the answer do we really need a mediator or do we really need a leader and if it comes out will he be able to solve the problem this is the thing Thank you, sir. If some part of the country has a problem like the way Manipur is, what should the Indian state do? Anywhere in this country, is Taraka kus ghatna hua, manlo, it happens anywhere in this country, what would the government of India do? What is that the government of that state will do? If the state is not functioning, what the government of India will do? What are the provisions in the constitutions? That's what you need to know. I don't think it's about the mediator as such. I think the state must take care of itself. Insofar as Manipur is a part of the Indian Union, the Indian state must take care of itself. So taking care of Manipur is taking care of itself. The moment you started looking as if it is a foreign country and you know you have terms like buffer zones, shifting populations, the Indian army, Indian security forces are not doing peacekeeping duty in a foreign country. There are, and they should carry out their responsibility as a, a state should do, taking care of itself. So taking care of the crisis in Manipur is the sole responsibility of the Indian state. I have no doubt about this, so I don't think there is a need for a mediator as such. But the Indian state can think about various ways that I have suggested. One, they, you know, break the ice, bring these MLAs to sit together. Come se come, therapies ke samne jo hai na, Mia Bibi jo jhagra hota hai, do you force them to sit and talk at less? And that's what I said. When if the prime ministers call these BJP MLAs from the state of Manipur, how many of you believe that some will not come? 
Tell me very honestly, how many of you really think that if the prime minister is called Kuki ho ya Naga ho, Maite ho, jo bhi ho, BJP ke sab MLA idhar aza ho mere saath, baatchit karna hai. Ye kya chal raha hai? If the prime minister does like this, do you think that some will say that may nahi betunga uske saath? Tell me. See, kyun nahi karte hai? If you want to put up a mediator, then you think that once you do that at the level of the political, you have a meeting with the security forces and do, there are lacunas in this, there are armed groups. How to handle them? Itne saal se aapne istimal karke rakha hua hai some groups. We all know, many of these groups are part of counterinsurgency mechanisms, as many people have pointed it out. You can hear, even in Karan Thapa's interview, Bablu Leitongbam, the well-known human rights activist, said, these groups have been used as a counter-insurgency tools, first against the Nagas, second against the Maites. Think about it. It's not the government of India cannot do anything. Indian government is not bechara, bhai. It's not a helpless third world country. Is one of the emerging powers in this globe, and you can't even handle your backyard. You um, global leader, banne jao kya? I mean, you need to ask these fundamental questions. Ya sidhe si bolo ki it doesn't matter. Manipur maro, dubo, us lena dena nahi. I would be happy if you dare to say that also. Kam se kum clarity to aayega na dimaag mein ki whether do you do you really care or not? To bolo sidhe si baat hai. Just what question? Okay, just last question. This is not exactly a question. I just want to compliment Professor Pimal. It's Okay, I am Mr. Shaiza. I'm from Manipur. I'm a Naga from Ukrul district. So I'm very much a stakeholder in this whole messy situation. Yes, it is very encouraging to admit one's own mistakes and the model, the approach that you have utilized today is indeed the right step in the right direction. I would, taking this opportunity, appeal my Mayday brethren to follow this measured and matured approach in dealing with this crisis, not the other way around. In social media, I have come across someone just saying, Kogi uh, Shaktu, that is not the right approach to do at this moment. This is time when we have to coolly sit down and appeal to the other community, even if they appear to be very adamant. And this approach, I'm sure, would bear fruit. If the government has denied us, if they have ignored us, we have our own role to play. And me as a Naga has my own role to play. I cannot remain a silent spectator anymore. If two brothers are fighting in the family, the whole family equation is disturbed. And I am facing the same crisis over and over again. As far as this conflict is concerned, perhaps before you, I had been victimized before. The Kokinaga conflict precedes this one. So I've been a victim of this, but I hold no crutch against my Kuki brethren. What is lacking, what I uh, observe is that this kind of discourse, mature discourse, is not forthcoming from the other side. Whether it is my ignorance, I don't know. But at least from the Mayday community, this has been going on. And I urge you to continue doing this in a very mature manner so that somewhere or the other, there will be a solution out for our community. We can't change our neighbors. We have to live with it, whether we like it or not. So let us work together for the command cause of everyone. That's it. Thank you.
sir, since we are discussing on the problem and the root cause of the violence in Manipur, I just want to highlight a one very peculiar and very particular things that is happening in Manipur since from a time immemorial. As we are uh, Manipuri, and I think so many non-Manipuri are also here, they, they, uh, we are so used to, to this term called economic blockage. So, economic blockage on the highways. So, I think many of the non-Manipuris might have not known this, but this, uh, we are very used to it, and we, we didn't even have the, we, we, we never bother and cared about the impact of the economic, economic block since we are very used to it. So my question is that, sir, if you are a Chanakya to this present government, what kind of permanent solution will you, ask, will you suggest the government to bring the permanent solution to this economic blockade? Because this has created a huge, huge impact to our lives. And Manipur is such a backward state. I'm saying again, it's such a backward state. If you happen to check the records of the BPL uh, families who are under the below poverty line, they are very huge. They're very huge. It's, they are saying the MIT are very advanced community and all. I'm a MIT myself. I live in Imphal. There are so many MIT living in my community, in my area. Those, those in Nepal, they are living in a very bad condition. They are, very, they are living in a very poor condition. Recently, an inmate from the, one of the relief camp, uh, from, in, from, uh, they, uh, I think they are from Kampupi, and they are settled in somewhere in the Infal. The inmates told that though we, our houses are being burned and my shops have been completely burned, I find myself that there is a little uh, you know, relief that I don't have to pay taxes to the illegal uh, the illegal taxes that some sections of the community, I must say, the, those miscreant, those uh, illegal uh, insurgent groups or the cookie cum militants, I, 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 I should not have named them, but obviously it's the class between the two communists, I have to put it out. So that particular person has said that I, can, I find a re little relief that I, I don't have to pay taxes like two to 2,000 to 3,000 per month, though I'm a poor myself, that, that I belong to a poor family myself. So, is there any way out? So, this is my ultimate question to you. To, to Professor Bimol or the Professor Amarjit, either of you can answer this. Thank you. I think you have asked, you must remove. If you're asking me as a Chanakya, then I'll say make them confuse <laughs> and make it sure that you don't leave your chair. Remain as Mantri throughout your life. But if I'm not a Chanakya, then I said it's a state responsibility to take care of. The national highway is the responsibility of the union government. And then secondly, in our civil society, this is a funny, this is a militaristic thinking. You block the highway, you trouble them, supply line khatam kar lo, and that kind of a thinking. Um, it's inflicting yourself. At the end of the day, you are creating an estranged relationship with your neighbors and your own family members, to use that term. Uh, it doesn't help. You know, you are getting by inflicting yourself pain. You don't realize that you are inflicting pain on others. You're only inviting him or her to think in a similar line. So you will create complicated pictures. So I know blockade has been a regular feature of our life. Uh, it's inflicting ourselves. Man, this is a tool of, not of the courageous people, it's a tool of the weak. You know, and with due respect to women, this is what the women do, nakra to husband. I don't eat food. Inflicting yourself just to get attention of the others, which is not done. If you're courageous, you will not do like that. Why should I hurt myself? You know? So I think this uh, blockade is, is a weapon of the weak. Uh, it's not normally done, so I think you, you, we can look at that, that blockade part, uh, to my mind, is again, we know, by and large, uh, those of you in social sciences, it's a gold mine if you want to study the nature of the state and how it functions and manifests in the India's northeast, and do a comparative study of how the Indian state behave in UP, Bihar, or rest of the country. It is a, it's an interesting 
unfolding nature of the Indian state. Indian state, you will begin to see more like a, a Bhagwan with different roots, different images and self gets reflected in different areas. In Northeast, uh, they reflect an image which is less than desirable uh, throughout our history, last 50, 60 years of our life or more. Uh, people like me who landed up in the so-called mainstream, uh, we've been here and it's at place, Amarjit is a slightly younger. We've been here in this so-called national mainstream in academic institution for almost 30 years as a faculty. Uh, sin. So we started speaking up. Uh, you know, mainstream is where my father used to go for education in the late 50s and early 60s. And my generation are here to teach people from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, from Gujarat to Nagaland. That's a change in the way we do it. See, even in Punjab University, you have faculty from our state. JNU, we have at least what? 14, 15 of us. It's not such a state, eh? but we have quite a number. Of, in fact, we are the largest, if you compare with the rest of the states in the India's Northeast. I heard that there are more than 200 teachers in Delhi University, only from Manipur, both the scheduled tribe and uh, general people. We are doing good in some sense, but we also need to change ourselves a lot. We have a lot of parochial outlooks and small minds like we fight. That's why I say it. The entire Northeast will be swept by this new liberal political economy. Uh, I am scared of heavy militarization of that place in the evolving geopolitics of this area. The realignment between India, Israel, and, and, and uh, United States vis-a-vis -vis with China. Uh, I have been saying this, people call me those days alarmists, but it's, I'm more and more convinced now that the North is becoming another Cebu. There's a place in Philippines where the American military base is there, or an Okinawa kind of thing in Japan, where military bases are there for strategic purpose. If North East turns out to be like that, whether you are a Naga or a Kuki or a Khasi or a Homia, I was about to use an English word, bad word. It will be all in a bad shape if that thing happens in the days to come. I think we should be very careful. Why should we waste our energy on useless thing? Think big. There's a greater challenge which is common for all of us. And this kind of ethnic crisis is draining our energies and, and, and our capacity to face a larger challenge which is shooting across the region. I think that is important for us not to forget it. Uh, good evening, Professor uh, Amarjeet and Professor Koijam. I'm Sharmili. Uh, I am a faculty here in Punjab University. Uh, I, I teach engineering. Uh, so most of my friends are watching this program live and uh, they have a lot of uh, questions uh, addressed to both of you. But I'm just going to uh, focus on one question that needs our immediate attention. And that question is addressed to Professor Akoyjam. I'll, I'll just read out a message that was sent by my friend. Okay. I'll just read out his message. Uh, now that the Supreme Court of India has absolved the Editor's Guild of India by saying that it was freedom of expression and the onus now is on us to prove that the news report has helped in inciting more violence. What do we do now? We just leave it or we contest it? Ma'am, please repeat. Should I repeat the question? No, no, I, I got it. You know, I don't know whether I should say this. I was in touch with one of them before they visited. And uh, there's a team of us who have been doing analysis of the national newspaper. It's a painstaking work. We're using theories and methods from media studies, trying to see how the national media have reported. And when I share with one of them, they said, you know, they also like to look, have a look at our report and so on. I, initially, I was very happy when they said, 
newspaper media should not be part of the information war this is what the editor guild of india has a press release we have the document that the media should not be part of the information war i think unfortunately uh, easy i has uh, become an example of what it wanted to avoid as simple as that uh, whether they provoke the supreme court is taking a legal viewpoint uh, uh, in the sense that whether what have what they have uh, published is um, a sort of uh, creating law and order issues inciting problem on the ground that's a very different questions the legal questions the other side of the question is are you doing justice to your intended mandate or you just become part of the information war because some of the factual things which have come up now from the official document on forest the way it is written uh if i were in their place i would have honestly accepted with humility that yes we made mistakes you publish a photo of a forest office being burned down as a house of a cookie and then you suddenly change it into by removing cookie house being burned it doesn't make sense anybody who knows media study will know why a particular framing is done how framing influences the data or the information you give in a report like for example the discourse has been wrongly framed in terms of minority christians minority tribal you know instead of looking at it as a large and some people met us so confused saying that this is nothing to the with insurgency we forget that manipur is a deeply armed groups isliye to manifestation is different no whether it is from the valley or this everybody is armed so why is it so because it is a area of armed conflict reasons the people are armed like this so how can you negate that there's bound to have an uh, you know arm movements or arm insurgencies implication in the whole affairs uh, that's what unfortunately i'm still saying it that i'm very intrigued that why this violence has been going on why the indian state has not been able to stop it or is it i have said it many times this inaction of the indian state itself is an action that gets implicated in the violence i have said this i'm repeating it here again the inaction of the indian state its inability to stop the violence itself is an action implicated in this crisis i have no doubt about it that the question is why why is the indian state doing like this is it that you can't handle oh bahut mar jayega some people told me i said it's a threat is an excuse by intimidating me say lot mar jayega main to kahunga bhi kyun marega is it inevitable kab se i mean there are lots of things so we 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 should be asking this question i think instead of blaming communities number one i'm saying that the communities themselves have to be also reflect on themselves there are a lot of things undesirable thing you know hate has been going on it's been normalized in some sense but the primary thing that we all must be asking is the abdication of the role of the state i think that's important for us not to forget so i think this press is a similar kind of thing has the uh, editor gill has abdicated his responsibility and to my mind as i said they have become the example of what they appeal the media not to be not to be part of the information war i get a feeling that they have become part of the information war is very clear from that report i want to say something on this context <clears throat> somewhere our happiness and sadness is being also being playing out the day we find reports supporting us many of us are happy the next day we saw attacking us we are sad somewhere during the course of violence several report has actually played with our our own feelings and emotions and we have been traumatized day by day on the edge of the girls of india you know the supreme court has taken initiatives we must wait for that several sits have been formed at several levels 
And I, I was also for looking several reports with clear minds. There was one report among all reports that we, we, it's not that we don't find some report reasonable. There was a report which says that we must acknowledge there are people on both sides who have good wisdoms, ready to share and acknowledge our pains and suffering. Their report which really take care for that we should not engage it in. And there are reports which I find very interesting, some reports, sensible reports, right, we should be moving for community enhancing approach toward the peace, rather than community divided approaches. Yes, we were hoping for the girls of India, both of us were discussing around this time, that they have set certain kind of ethical standards. Now they have to answer themselves with the same ethical standards. And we know how things, and I, I was also thinking about several issues which can be taken in very right directions. One of the issues which I missed to say in the, during my, was on the issues of forests, for instance, on the reserve and uh, uh, protected areas and issues of evictions. You know, this can be discussed, taking into various, even including Supreme Court judgment on right of the forest dwellers. And this can be taken like forest right act with editor guild of, of India didn't spend much time I think or they don't care to read all details. They could have actually give it a, a clear direction how rights of the forest dwellers, the tribes, the forest dwelling people can be, look at it including the process of the eviction also. One forest conservation act allows certain areas, which is the property of the state, or from the product of its state, it has a, has a, has a, a, a state has a command, or which is, uh, which, which, uh, you know, so a state can announce protected areas under the section 28, clause one of the forest conservation act. Now, the forest right act say on the other hand, that every forest dweller who have been there for generations and who have lived with it, their records, their land records, their right need to be, process of identifying their rights and record need to be completed first before, you, before they are being evicted. For those people who have lived for generations. There are legal issues in between these two acts. Many of time, forest right egg cannot egg does not come into rescues of many tribal people in the hill when it comes to land resource extractions. There are issues or legal issues. Now, Supreme Court has come up also give the right that people who have been victims of eviction certainly have a right to claim for it. There are procedures to it. In fact, in the beginning, in the case of Zhang Bilez in Chuchamber, Kopong area, when protected areas, issues of uh, protected area announcement. Keno was actually raising these issues uh, in, in the court of law. So these are, there are legal issues. There are channels to fight for the rights of the evicted people. But it would be wrong to reduce eviction as issues of one communities. Already, I think the, the chief principal conservators of Manipur First Department have, have come out with that, which was published in the NDTV, that how eviction has been occurring for the last one, two years. And I have seen eviction myself. There are many unreported evictions. I have seen eviction in Loktak, wetland area. I have seen eviction in Kakching. I have seen eviction in Chao Krul. I have seen eviction in Senapati. If evictions is the issue, if the right of the forest dweller people is the issue, there are channels to fight it out. There are a lot of people who work for it. Look at the national, national land rights activist uh, writings. There are many data, data is in the public domains. We can, there, can, there are many ways to fight. The Supreme Court themselves say, itself says that if it, people, when you evict, there are certain records to be cited. But there's also other the right, other the act which says that it can be, all the surveys and the, all, the, all the process can be done later on also. There, there are legal issues to be, trust, to be discussed. So when ECI, Editor Guild of India, reports this kind of issue, they must take care about the debate which has been going on for a long time. 
And who are taking initiative in to address that? Many of us, I said, when we fight for the right of the forest dwellers and forest dependent people, I, I must take just opportunities. I have been working with the, the issues of uh, forests and forest dependent people in the eastern side of the Impal, in the, in the, in the foothill of the Namaiching Hills. When this whole this, uh, initiative was taken for Cultural University at the foothill, many Metis villagers questioned it because it disturbs that relationship they have with the mountain area, the foothill areas. They have been rituals and the mountains of part the community rituals. So it's not about tribe only. It's not about forest dweller, but also forest dependent peoples. So it, this debate can be direct, directed in a good direction. It can have a people in the media, people who are intellectual should give a good direction to it. So it, there, are re, there are rooms to fight it out. There are rooms to, there are a lot of things to be cleared out. And on many occasions, for a right act 2006 is not, is, is not been taken into consider by the own union laws. Many acts of union economic policies or economic activities, be it infrastructure projects or extractions, they are exe exempted from, from application of forest right act. For instance, so there are legal issues. So right of the forest dwellers can be discussed in a better way. So this thing could have been brought into pictures. It also includes other that is commissions which come up with on the issues of or so and so many hill, uh, hills have been become part of the valley. And, and this has become a concern. Where was this, where was this people who looking, we come up with this, when so many, uh, so many uh, uh, villages were submerged by hydro power projects? Where were these people when, when so many uh, said to try communities are being there, right? Has been, their, their own agricultural land has been, you know, uh, you know, they have been displaced. Where were these people when so many people are fighting for their compensations? Suddenly somebody comes, some people comes, started interested in the issues. So we, instead people, we, other than receiving this report, we should be engaging, each of us should be engaging with the report and give a good direction to it. There are ways to do it. I'm for the right of the people. There are, there are ways to do it, but it, it cannot be discussed. And, and you know, this crisis of forest, this crisis of resources is also the very good time for us to build a common future, a common future of Manipur. People should come together and share the concern. There are common concerns, common, common interests, common rights that we can fight. And there are enough opportunities to come out from our own ethnic enclosure and start connecting each other on issues of forest, on issues of land and resources. There are enough spaces. There are already is already space. There are already spaces. We need to give more, we need to empower ourselves to those common spaces. It looks like those spaces have been given, taken a back seat at the moment. They have, they have, they have, they have lost it, uh, it, it, it's what you call, it, it's space at this moment. There are space to do it. There are way, good ways to do it. Thank you very much.